Let's consider the secret life of the innermost nesting doll. Living most of her life in the dark inside the other nesting dolls, she has plenty of time to think, if she could. Sadly, she has no brain. However, when an innermost nesting doll hears that Geico not only saves people money, but also has been providing great service for over 75 years, she thinks it's obvious you should switch. Because yes, switching to Geico is a no-brainer. Pity the innermost nesting doll and her lot in life. Geico presents oh, yet another voicemail from your roommate. Hi! So, about the kitchen. Turns out, when there's a grease fire, you're not supposed to throw water on it. <laughs> Who would have known, right? Anyways, the fire department is here, and it's totally cool. Give me a call back when you get a chance. The Geico Insurance Agency could help keep your personal property protected, like if danger is your roommate's middle name. Visit Geico.com to see how easy it is to switch and save on renter's insurance. Hey guys, what's going on? You are listening to Botch Draw, only on ThisWeekInGeek.net. I'm your host, Mike the Birdman Dodd, and my God, do I owe you guys an apology. This has been an episode that has been a tremendously long time in coming, and I just want to come out and apologize for it. Frankly, I should have had this done months ago, but um, I really wanted inspiration to strike, and I've gone back and forth what I want this uh, episode to be, and I've been struggling with it because I've been working through this with my own gaming group, uh, who are the Terrible Warriors slash the uh, Cambridge Chronicles crew. That's Mr. Christopher and Alex, the producer. And um, we've had some kind of changes in our lineup there, and it's had me really look at the philosophy of how I want to GM. And specifically, that's going to be what today's topic of Bots Roll is going to be, is GMing, how to GM, and just some GM thoughts and musings. I'm sure I'll have more on this uh, at a later date, but I just want to come. The Starlight Lounge presents An Evening with the Progressive Box. The moon, yeah. That's Hugo, tickling the ivories. He just saved by bundling home and auto with Progressive. Gonna finally buy a ring for that gal of yours, Hugo? Send her my condolences. hi oh This next one's for you, too. There's a burglar in my heart. Thank you. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Discounts not available in all states or situations. And uh, jump right into it, uh, so to speak here. So, um, for those of you that don't know and maybe are new to Bostrol, Bostrol is the show where I take a look at different topics, um, items, maybe a review, maybe an actual play. It could be anything involving the role-playing game industry and my experiences with it over the last 25 plus years. And uh, specifically with this episode, like I said, I want to talk about game mastering and whatnot. Kind of what goes into it, what you should do, what you shouldn't do. Maybe give you some ideas to get your own group started. Maybe brush up on some skills you already have. Or uh, just maybe give you some ideas you maybe haven't considered just yet. So... What is game mastering? Game mastering at its most simple form is you're a storyteller, first and foremost. And being a game master within a role-playing game is you're collaboratively telling a story between you and your friends, be it at a convention or maybe after school or maybe after work. Either way, you're working with you and your friends or you and a group of people to tell a story cooperatively. And that involves you uh, creating a world full of interesting, cool characters, um, making things interactive with this world to make a story come to life. And I'm not saying you have to write War and Peace or have the epic scale of Lord of the Rings, though it certainly doesn't hurt. Your stories can be smaller in state. It might be, hey, go save the princess or the prince or... Someone has robbed the king. Go retrieve his treasure. Fight the dragon. Um, or maybe it could be in a different game system, like say Star Wars. Like, hey, go fight Darth Vader. Or um, maybe you're playing a homebrew system. And maybe you're playing, I don't know, Power Rangers, for example. And you have to defeat Lord Zed and, um, I don't know, Lord Vile or something. It, 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 it can be anything. As long as you have a cool story idea in mind and you want to share it with your friends, that's your starting point as a GM, is t trying to figure out the story, ultimately. And some people may say, well, first you need a rule set. Well, and we'll talk about rule sets in just a second. But the idea, in my mind, when you're GMing 
or dungeon mastering, depending on how you want to spin it, is you have to have a cool, you have to have the tools to tell a story. And that means you have to have your ducks in a row. And I'm not saying you have to stick so rigid, because there's also multiple ways to GM too. And once again, I'll get into that a little bit later. But there's running a free form world, which is a sandbox, or there's running uh, an established module or a book, like say Dragon Heist, stuff like that, which is a more here's your storyline, here's your NPCs, try to get them to go along these paths, and you'll have a really cool adventure in the end. Uh, full disclosure, I have never run an adventure out of a book. I've stolen ideas from books, but I've never said, hey guys, we're going to the Tomb of Annihilation, or hey, we're going to the Ruins of Undermountain today. And I've never run those adventures. I've just never done it. Um, but anyway, back to the matter at hand. So, dungeon mastering. Hmm. So you want to tell a story. And this is my process. This is how I do a lot of my stories for Terrible Warriors. Is I sit down with a notepad or a notebook. My fabled notebook from Terrible Warriors. Which I've actually had people buy as part of the Terrible Warriors Patreon. Um... I sit down and I write down bullet points for a story or ideas. And um, because odds are my players won't listen to this, um, I might plan out, like currently right now I'm planning Shadowrun. And I'm doing that different from how I did, say, Cambridge Chronicles, which was D&D 5th edition. And I'm like, okay, what story do I want to tell? And I guess that kind of, I guess you got to decide what, what type of story you want to tell first. Do you want a short story or do you want a long story? Long story means you have a long overacting arc. Think of it as like a TV show, for example. Um, they could be short episodic adventures with a common thread running through it. A good example of this might be, say, Doctor Who, where, um, okay, the overarching threat this season is the Daleks, but... They don't necessarily have to show up in every episode. You just have to advance that plot a little bit forward, um, episode by episode. But they're not the central bad guy. Or you do something more long form, like let's say Game of Thrones, where the episodes you can't really watch one without knowing what happened in the previous one. You have to know what's kind of going on, or at least that's how I would view it, anyhow. So start down with your idea, and. Your idea, like, okay, in today's episode, or today's adventure, we are going to go to Waterdeep, which is a town, a very big town, city even, in the Forgotten Realms. Okay, cool, so we're going to Waterdeep. Why are we going to Waterdeep? Um, a lord has asked us to track down a criminal who is robbing uh, caravans. Okay, cool, so now we've got our bad guy, and we have our adventure. Cool, there's this bandit. He's stealing from caravans. He's some. He's hiding in Waterdeep. Cool. Now this can be a simple one-off adventure, or it can be the beginning of something else. It can be something huge if you want to turn it into something more. Say, oh, the bad guy was hired by this uh, wizard who's looking for a certain uh, caravan, and there's a magical item he wants stolen, but he doesn't know which caravan it's in, so he's robbing every single one. Okay, so you can go episodic. Or you can go long form, depending on how you want to do it. But either way, write down your idea and like, okay, cool. Here's my idea. Here's the skeleton. Let's put some meat on those bones. So you got to figure out, okay, your NPCs. Who are your NPCs? Well, um, there's that bandit that we're talking about. There's your bad guy. Flesh him out. Give him a name. A couple things about his background. A couple things that make him distinctive. And that's something that a lot of Dungeon Masters make their, all their NPCs kind of like, you know, snidely whiplash. They're just like twirly mustache bad guys. Or they're incredibly well thought out, but they don't get a chance to speak. Give your guys something unique about them. Like, change them up. Give them something unique. Like, um, I don't know, maybe they have an, an eye patch. Uh, maybe they have really weird colored hair. They speak with a lisp. Um, he carries a really distinctive weapon. Like, stuff like that. Like, make your bad guys interesting. Make, make them cool. Like, make them... Hell, think, like... Be a character designer. Be so, Make them something neat. Something you want to fight. Um, like, with uh, Cambridge Chronicles. I wanted my uh, Prince of the Thieves guild to be this awesome, badass warrior chick 
who didn't take any guff. And I kind of based her off of like Assassin's Creed. That was the kind of look I had planned out for her or my pirate captain. Um, I had her planned out. I use a lot of female NPCs just because everybody assumes everybody you find in D&D is a dude. Or at least that's been my experience. Anyway, I don't run across a lot of female NPCs in the games I've played. Um, but anyway, um, yeah, just make your characters interesting. Give them good motivations, too. Um, because this is a role-playing game. It's not necessarily combat after combat. Make them interesting. Give them some witty dialogue. Maybe uh, your bandit speaks in riddles. Or maybe he's incredibly boastful. Something like that. Just make them interesting. Or maybe the king is a moron. I know, for example, uh, when we ran Cambridge Chronicles, Lord Kilsh was an idiot. A delightful, drunken idiot. But he had a lot of power. He liked Alex's character because, hey, you're my old drinking buddy and you've helped save the kingdom from dire bears so you're a good guy come on like you know you can do things like that like and that's another thing too don't be afraid to let your npcs have relationships with the pcs if they agree to it like maybe that bandit who's robbing the caravan maybe he wronged one of the pcs at one point or maybe they know him um, and they're like, maybe they've lost touch over the years, stuff like that. You can make things interesting, like, 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 uh, like that too. Sorry if I'm kind of stuttering here. I'm also kind of looking over my uh, notes here. Um, okay. So you've got it. Your basic, your, your, ba- your basic idea, robbing caravans. Um, but how do you want to make it interesting? And this is where you can steal from like other movies or television shows make it interesting like okay we're robbing caravans well what if i wanted this to be like a heist what if you guys are patrolling the road switching caravans going up and down the same stretch of road uh during the course of a day and they're just switching back and forth that means maybe there's a a horse chase or something or maybe they're patrolling the skies using like, like a flying carpet or a fly spell and just watching the road or staying invisible near a common point and they're hiding in, or maybe there's the symbols they're hiding in the friggin' bushes waiting for an attack of opportunity to happen. Um, and yeah, just don't be afraid to steal. I mean, don't make it so friggin' literal where it turns into like a Michael Bay movie, but don't be afraid to poach ideas from better writers than yourself. Um, cause it makes things fun. It like really does. Um, I'm kind of going over a list of like uh, kind of bullet points here. Uh, okay, so you've got your story. What do you do if your players go off the beaten path? Well, there's an old dungeon master trick called the plot railroad. You can force them back, not by leading them around by the nose, but say, hey guys, I don't know if you want to get paid. The king really wants us to go do this. Or um, you can tug on their backstory string, say, hey, um, we'll just use Alex as an example. Hey, Lord Kill says he'll owe you a favor if you go take care of this bandit problem. And he could be like, oh, all right, well, maybe I could. But let's say they just don't. This is where the act of being an improviser will become immensely invaluable. And this is where you really got to think off your feet. This is where you really kind of got to know your group. Are they the kind that will go with your story or are they willing to go off the beaten path and go ride dinosaurs? Um, Because you don't know. That's the wonderful thing about role-playing games versus video games. It can get ridiculous and stupid and really fun. Sometimes some of the best moments of RPGs are born out of improvisation. And other times it's... You fucked my game, dude. I don't know what to do now. Um, And that's the thing. You can even pause the game temporarily and say to your players look you're we're not going the way i want us to go or we're not going the way i think we're going can we can we rule things back here a little bit can we roll back a touch and if you and your friends are anything like mine they'll understand and that's another thing too being a dm is be willing to be adaptable but be willing to be open to craziness because sometimes the best moments of the night are born out of like i said random things that happen i know uh in cambridge chronicles i want to say it was tristan let a chicken loose in a dress shop and it turned into one of the most hilarious moments of our game is where randomly there's all these chickens running through this town and 
it's enough to distract one of the shop owners, something like that. Um, so be, be adaptable, if anything, if you're going to be a storyteller. Um, because it'll make things so much more fun for your players if it feels like their actions have consequence and have impact on the world. Because that's one of the things I constantly worry about in my games, is I want my players to feel like they're part of something. Like, I'm not just railroading them from plot A to point B. Um, like, um, and that's where episodic content can really be your friend. If you don't want to tell the epic tales of the Game of Thrones and the Targaryens versus uh, the Lannisters, you don't have to. Sometimes it's just Captain Picard fighting the Borg. And it's a one-off episode sort of thing. You can do that. You don't have to be beholden to create an epic. And that's my failing as a game master, is I always want to create these world-saving epics. And I had a friend of mine years ago who goes, Mike, not every adventure needs to be about saving the world. Sometimes it's just about going to point A to point B to have some fun, to have an adventure, and that's the end of the day. I'm like, okay, I get that. And that's how Cambridge Chronicles started out, actually. Cambridge Chronicles started out, uh, which I took one of the books from Skyrim. I took the... um, I took the quest design from Skyrim. Like, here, go find out why this person's turning into a werewolf every day or why they're in jail. Can you help them sort of thing? And it was supposed to be, here, here's a bunch of one-off quests. Do something. And then eventually it turned into the Dark God 4F uh, trying to take over the world and eventually end the Forgotten Realms to take it out of the take it out of existence so to speak. And I see a number of problems I had with that campaign because it's the first time I've ever run a long form game in like 20 years. Um, I'd run some long form Shadowrun games, but I never put any more thought into it other than, hey, here's 10 minutes into the future. I'd never really thought about it. But anyway, um, where was I going with this? So yeah, telling your story. Where am I going here? Um... And then, depending on what you want to do with your world... Okay, so you've got your cool NPCs, you have your basic storyline. Um, where is your game set? And this is something where I struggle so much. Um, I love D&D, but I don't know fuck all about Kryn. I don't know fuck all about the Forgotten Realms. I've never read Dragonlance. I've never read Dark Sun. I only know enough about Ravenloft because it's got vampires and werewolves and shit. Um, I know Strahd von Zarevich controls it and the Dread Realms and all that shit. Okay, I understand the basics of it. Your players may not know fuck all. That has been my problem, is I'm having to drip feed them lore. And this is something you don't have to do, or if you really want to, you can. You're creating a role-playing game. You're creating a world for your players. They don't necessarily have to know that the Renraku Corporation has a subsidiary in like Shanghai, China. They don't need to know that um, Sater Krupp has an electronics division that runs out of Toronto and the main base is on Bay Street. That's lore. They don't necessarily need to know. Give them enough lore to make the world interesting, but they don't need to know every goddamn little facet. And that's something that I've always struggled with because I want them to know the lore as well as I do, not so they can use it against me. And we'll talk about that in a second because they will. Um... I want the lore to be as deep and as immersive as possible. Like, for example, running Shadowrun there. I know my guys have done the reading once, six months ago. So do I expect them to know everything about the Awakening? No. But a friend of mine said this to me. Mike, there's a difference between what the player character knows and what, and what the player knows. So the player character may know all these little details about the world. Let them. The player doesn't need to know unless unless they want to know. They will ask you, like, okay, Mike, would my character realistically know X? Yeah. Okay, cool. That makes things a lot friggin' easier because now in the context of, let's say, Shadowrun, um, I can let the player know, okay, uh, you're in Seattle. You know Lone Star holds the police contract for the city, so you know you're going up against Lone Star cops. Um Whereas the player might be like, oh, Lone Star's the cops, right? And they're like a private military corporation or they're a private security firm, right? Yeah. Yeah. You know that now. 
but your player, but your PC already knew that. Oh, okay. And then they can start asking you more questions. And that's the thing. Don't get upset because your players are asking you questions. Being a DM means you got to be patient because you want to have a good time. You want to tell this really cool epic story and you want it to be neat. And if you're willing to sit through a few moments of questions, be willing to. Um, I'm not saying get bombarded with telling them everything about Lord of the Rings and give them the the play-by-play of, like, say, the Cimmerillion, but give them enough that it's interesting. And if the players are really that invested in the world or if you can make it that interesting to them, they'll go seek it out. They'll learn on their own. That's my hope with Shadowrun is that I'll make the world interesting enough for Alex and Tristan that they'll go seek out more knowledge. Like I did when I first played with my first DM, Ryan, I started reading the Shadowrun novels, like Burning Bright. Um, I can't remember what the bike, what the combat biker one was. But the world had me interested. And don't be so intimidated by a world's lore as to not try it. Like, for example, one of the games I'm hopefully going to run on Cambridge Chronicles this season, because we're doing sci-fi as the theme this year, is Battletech. How do I explain the great houses? How do I explain the clan wars? And you know what? I don't have to. You are a mech warrior on the periphery. And that's another thing, too. You can use the lore to your advantage, uh, too. Like, say, let's go back to D&D again. Okay, your players exist in the Forgotten Realms. They know where Waterdeep is. They know where... Um, I'm trying to think. There's another city that I'm forgetting the friggin' name of. You know what? It, it, it doesn't matter. Because Cambridge doesn't exist in, in the Forgotten Realms. Your player characters could be completely ignorant. Of like, oh man, Waterdeep, heard of it, but I've never been there. So to speak. They could... My players are druids. They grew up in, in the fucking woods. They don't necessarily know the world around them. They know the forest. And that's about it. So the lore can work for you. It can work against you. And now we're going to talk about the lore lawyer. Uh, Sometimes, let's say uh, we're playing in a world. uh, Let's say Tristan, for example. Tristan's one of my guys on the show. He loves WoW. He loves World of Warcraft. I would not... He wouldn't do this to me, but he'd think about it. Um, If I set a game in the world of WoW... I better know what the fuck I'm talking about. Because if he says so-and-so wouldn't do that, and I say, oh, well, um, okay, I guess they didn't. If it was a major plot point, they've won. Um, And sometimes people who know the setting so well, if you let them win, they will win every argument after after that. And I'm paraphrasing a friend of mine, uh, Noah, who did this on his web series, Counter Monkey. And he's not wrong, because I've actually run into this with Marvel games. I've run into this with uh, Shadowrun, specifically when I was running this game as a kid. Um, and it was just like, uh, like, okay, I concede that maybe Lawfire the Dragon doesn't necessarily do this, and maybe this isn't the best way to handle it. But you got to remember, it's your world. Not the world that's written from the books. Sorry, guys. Doctor Wiley is trying to say hi. Wiley, can you can can you sit down, buddy? Good kitty. Anyway, sit down, boy. Um, lore is important. Lore can be fun. That's the thing. Lore is flavor. You are okay. Maybe that's a good way to look at dungeon mastering. Dungeon mastering is creating a really awesome steak. You know the meat's good. But it's how you season it and everything that you serve with it. Lore is like the sides. The steak is the story. And you can have an epic mashed potato and an epic vegetable medley and that's fucking great. But if the steak sucks, it doesn't matter how good the goddamn potatoes are because no one's going to give a shit. And that's what you got to remember. Make sure your steak is good. Serve your players steak. And let the sides fall where they may. And that's something, I'm like I said, I struggle with that all the time. Um, and that kind of comes to my next thing. Um, 
is talking about settings and rules. Now, you don't have to play with the rules as as they're given. Like, for example, playing D&D. Hell, if you want to play D&D using Pathfinder rules, you can do that. Because D&D is essentially Pathfinder 3.5 and Pathfinder is D&D 3.75. Basically, Pathfinder is D&D if it was fixed and it worked properly from the 3rd edition rules. Which are now coming in the 2nd edition, but that's neither here nor there. Um, point of the matter is, you've got to find a rule set that works for you. Um, and you've got to find a rule set that you like to teach your group. Because as a dungeon master... As a game master, it is your responsibility to teach uh, your system. And, for example, Shadowrun right now is in its 5th edition rule set. I do not like the 5th edition rules. Holy shit, they are math. So I'm going back to the 2nd edition rules, which are not math, which are a hell of a lot simpler, which are um, basically D6 equals success, uh, if you need to roll above a D six, uh, roll any sixes, see what numbers are, see what number. It's basically a success based test, so to speak. Basically, how many successes did I get versus you? It's me versus you in that regard. Um, so you don't need to play the latest edition of the game to have fun. You can find an older edition. Sometimes doing that's easy too, because if you look at places like say half price books. Amazon, eBay, even your local used bookstores will have shit tons of our role play books if you know where to look. Hell, Facebook is a wonderful resource for finding old role play books. If you just put up in your local buy and sell groups, hey guys, I'm looking for old role play books. What do you got? Um, I got a garbage bag full of uh, World of Darkness, Shadowrun, and I want to say Legend of the Five Rings. I think I paid 25 bucks and I got two garbage bags full. So I'm not saying everybody's going to necessarily hand you a garbage bag full of role play books, but look around. Um, so when you find a rule set that works for you, you can change that rule set if you don't like it. Like, um, that's called house ruling. But there is one house rule that you must remember have fun. If the, if the rule for spellcasting difficulty sucks, change it. If the rule for hitting, um, hitting a, a crit sucks, change it. Just adapt. Don't be afraid to change the rules to suit your group's play if you want to make it faster. Because I know um, some of D&D can get bogged down into math. It's like, okay, well, can I take a five-foot step? Or whatever. Some, and that's um, something that I'll, I'll touch upon in a future episode. Is sometimes minis help. We're like, do I take a five foot step? Does, does he flank me? Or do you want to do it more like I do? Or where it's more cinematic and you describe the action. And you say, well, can my guy reach him? Yes. Yes, he can. Sort of thing. As long as you're willing to say, okay, the guy is like 30 feet away. Um, so stuff like that you can do. Um, but have fun. Like, don't be beholden to the rules as much as you want to. And that's a, a not another thing, too. As, as I mentioned previously, don't be beholden to the setting. If you want to change things, do it. Because it makes things interesting. And that's why no two D&D games are going to be alike. Hell, even if, you, even if we both play uh, the starter adventure for D&D 5th, The Lost Minds of Fandelver, no two groups are going to play it the same. Because we're going to change up something somewhere. And it's going to make it much, 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 much more interesting for you as a DM if you're willing to change things up here and there. I'm continuing to look through my kind of notes here. Um, I guess the final point, or the final two points I want to make, is fun and storytelling. Um, As I mentioned, sometimes your players will go off the beaten path. See where they go. And just have fun telling a story you didn't necessarily want. Let's say, again, going back to the bandits robbing the caravan. Let's say they completely drop that plot hook. And they're like, okay, well, we're not going after the bandit. We're going after the guy who hired the bandit. Okay, you didn't plan for that. If you're the kind of person that can think on your feet fast, go with it. See what happens. Or say to your group, okay, guys, I need a few minutes to figure this out. 
go get some Mountain Dew and Cheetos. If you know what if you know what I mean by that joke, you're awesome. Um, but be adaptable because as the DM, you got to be having fun too. Otherwise, what's the point? You're just telling your players, let's play pretend and let's jerk each other off. And as a dungeon master, that sucks. You don't want to be you don't want to be telling a story you're not having fun telling. Um, because I kind of view dungeon mastering as the modern day bard, except it's the bard with audience participation because you got to be having fun too. Um, and that's kind of where you got to keep that in mind so, so much. Have fun. Oh my God. Game mastering shouldn't stress you out. It can. It very well does. It, it does stress me out at times too, but only because I want my guys to have so much fun. I want them to enjoy the game, enjoy the worlds I'm creating for them as much as the people who created them enjoyed making them for themselves. Like I want Alex and Tristan to to know the shadows. I want them to know the Yakuza's out there. I want them to know that um, Knight Errant and Lone Star are in this corporate bidding war. Stuff like that. I want them to know. I want them to ask me questions about that. I want them to say, hey, Mike, what, what's going on? And I want to be excited to tell them because I want them. To, basically, I, I, I'm inviting my friends into my mind. And, I am invite, and they're inviting me into theirs. And that's the really cool thing about dungeon mastering and, and role playing in general. You're there to create the most epic game you possibly can. And to have a laugh too. And that brings me to my final point. This is not you versus them. But it is and it isn't. What do I mean? Okay. You as the dungeon master want to tell a a cool story. But you also want to challenge your players. But it's not say, hey, here's the Tarrasque, your level one characters. Good luck, fuckface. No, you're not doing that. That's unfair. You still got to play by the quote unquote rules. As do they have to play by the rules. That's why I don't like players that are min-maxing. Like my friend AJ, who played very early on in Cambridge Chronicles. That's why I told him, when we're making characters, we're doing 3D6 and what you get is what you get. He's like, what do you mean 4D6? Don't drop, drop the lowest. No, fuck that. Real people, real players roll 3D6 and roll with it. Um, but no. What I mean by that is, don't become adversarial. Don't look for revenge. Don't look for ways to fuck them. But don't let them walk all over you either. You want to have the collaborative experience together. Because if you guys are, if your group is working together, you can create something that will last for, in essence, the rest of their lives. Because you're creating an experience that can only happen like this probably once. And if you turn it into pure, well, I've got a higher stat than you, good luck. But think about this. If they beat your higher stat creature, let it win. Let it go. Um, even if that means losing your big campaign bad guy to a stupid role. Actually, I was playing a game this weekend called Masks, and I was playing with Justin and some of the Patreon people uh, from Terrible Warriors in the private tip game. Which, if you want to find more information about that, it's patreon.com slash terriblewarriors, I think. Um, basically, I had this ability called Moment of Truth, which is the which is the player's middle finger to the GM. Within reason. Whatever I want to have happen, happens. So my character, uh, I was this character called Solar, who is this uh, little girl. I was 15 years old, and I was basically Goku. And I was like, okay, I shoot the plane out of the sky, fire a Kami Kami high energy wave at them, and I fly up and go Super Saiyan. And Justin had these epic bad guys who were ready to monologue, who were like, I am Ultron, and you are but ants beneath my booted heel. And I shot him out of the sky and crushed him like a tin can. And Justin's like, well, that was fun, but he let me do it. Because it served the story, made it interesting, made it cool. Be willing to serve the story for cool moments. Um, Another great piece of advice my friend Noah gave me, um, or gave in general, is let's say your big bad guy, like this this guy, like this Ultron dude, gets nuked. 
Maybe he gets away. Doesn't rob you of your cool moment, but maybe it was a body double. Or maybe it was a hologram. It's cheap, but it works. Or maybe, like me, I just flat out nuked the fucker. And it worked. But it was cool. So, how do I sum this all up? How to be a dungeon master? Like I said, I'm going to use the food example again. Your story is the steak. The lore is the side dishes. The NPCs and the flavor you add to the world is the spices you serve on your steak. How you do it. And then your degrees of dumbness is, well, how much intensity you want to add to your game. Or weirdness, so to speak. Because you can do that too. Um, And then you'll find out very quickly how your group plays. Are you a goofy dungeon crawl sort of group? Or are you a role play group? And... You'll have to have that conversation with your group at some point where are you more serious? For example, Alex is a weird mix between role play and goofy, whereas Tristan goes more role play than goofy. And it's balancing the two players that makes creating the world for them so interesting because I can have more extreme things happen, but then I get good cop, monkey cop, and then I get moments where Tristan's character goes insane and he's willing to act it out. So there are some great moments to be had, especially if you know your player group. And I guess that's my final piece of DM advice. Know your group, talk with them, and just ask them, what do you guys want? What kind of story, what kind of game do you want to play? And I'm sure between you and your group, you'll be able to figure out exactly what you want to do, how you want to do it, and you're going to have fun. Because that's the biggest takeaway from all this, is all of you have to have fun. Because otherwise... It's pretend with dice, and what's the point? You can go play Mass Effect. You can go play Skyrim for that. And it's you're either going to win or you're going to lose. But here, there's degrees of victory. There's degrees of loss. And that's what makes things fun. So anyway, guys, I've rambled on for about as long as I can. I really do apologize for the lateness of this episode. I'm going to try and get more out in the new year. I do want to talk more about the philosophy of role-playing games. Just to kind of give you guys an idea of what I've got picked out. Um, I'm pretty sure I did picking your first RPG, the licensed RPG, getting to know your world, creating a more immersive experience for you. Um, I'm going to find more because I've had these topics figured out since like August. So anyway, until next time, I've been Mike the Birdman Dodd. May all your successes be critical. May all your fumbles be just as critical. (laughs) I've been Mike the Birdman Dodd saying live for your diehard. I'll catch you guys again next time right here on Botched Roll only on thisweekingeek.net. Have the power to know when your power's back on with Orange and Rockland's text alerts. They help you stay in the know about local power outages. Just text OUT to my ORU 69678 and follow the prompts. Messaging and data rates may apply. Orange and Rockland, everything matters. And now, a thought from Geico Motorcycle. It took 15 minutes to take a spirit animal quiz online. Please be the cheetah. Please be the cheetah. And learn your animal isn't the cheetah, but the far less appealing blobfish. Oh, come on. To add insult to injury, you could have used those 15 blobfish minutes to switch your motorcycle insurance to Geico. Geico. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more on motorcycle insurance.